don't be scared. Don't be fearful. Forge your own path. There is so much news out there that is going to affect everything that you do. Shut it out. You know, they're, they're, they are attention grabbing. You will go down a black hole of doom scrolling. Don't do it. Um, get started and keep going. It's, uh, you know, like I said a couple of times, one property isn't enough, right? You need to build a portfolio of assets because before you know it, you will be 50 and you will think it's too late. It's not, but you'll think it's too late and then you're going to make mistakes. Welcome to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, the leading weekly show to help you unlock your full self, health and wealth potential. I'm your host, Bushy Martin, and each week, I go deep with the best investors, experts, leaders, and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind, discover freedom, and live by design. Subscribe now and join me and get invested in the life you really want. Let's get started. Hi, Freedom Fighters. When it comes to buying property, what do you think are the most important things to consider? Is it when, where, what, or how to buy? Well, in my experience, it's not when you buy, because you should be buying every time you're actually able to, but it's more about where you buy and what you buy and how you buy it that counts in the long run. Ultimately, and at the end of the day, it's the actual buying that counts, because this is where the actual rubber really hits the road, because talk's cheap and actions speak far louder than words and thoughts. So like anything, it's your doing, if you're doing it for the first time, or if you're only doing something part-time and very occasionally, and you don't have the required skills and expertise, why would you go it alone and try and do it yourself? When you're actually up against seasoned professionals who do it day in and day out on a, and they actually eat newbies for lunch in a true David and Goliath style battle where you're David and you're also blindfolded as you tiptoe, tiptoe through a minefield. So your chances of success are actually very slim because you just don't know what you don't know and you're likely to end up as discarded roadkill on the freeway of property success. And sadly, nowhere is this more prevalent than with the fairer sex. It's still hard to believe that in this day and age, one in three women retire with no savings. And even those women that do manage to save often end up with less than half of what most of us mere males do. Now, this continues to be very concerning for me. Unfortunately, the gender pay gap and maternity leave, along with increasing rates of divorce and separation, piled on top of primary caregiving responsibilities, put enormous financial pressure on women. And today's returning guest, Kate Hill, has made it her mission to help change this alarming trend. It's why she's co-authored her award-winning book, The Female Investor, which is actually gender neutral when it comes to its universal property investment learnings. So it's a great read for anyone who's serious about achieving sustainable success in property. And all of this is why I'm a big advocate of engaging good proven professional buyers agents who do nothing but research, search, select, undertake detailed due diligence and negotiate the purchase of properties day in and day out. Because the quality of what you buy, where you buy and how you buy it a mission critical to your property success. So why give this extremely important task to a rank amateur? And yes, I'm talking about you. But I also want to be clear that I'm not talking about any or all buyers agents because like all professions, there's a lot of very average players that sadly color the waters for the very few good ones who stand head and shoulders above the rest. It's for this reason that I've interviewed and continue to interview buyers agents here on the show because I want to help you to learn the ins and outs of this mission critical property buying process and to expose you to a range of buyers agents that will ultimately help you to identify the right approach as well as the right buyers agent to suit you. Who's not only experienced and expert at what they do, but just as importantly, are the right fit for you because you need to listen to your gut intuition on this. As a buyers agent or other property professional may be good at what they do, but if your highly tuned BS indicator is going off, then you need to listen to this and go with your gut. As I keep reinforcing, there's no one silver bullet solution in property because everyone's different. So you need to keep looking until you find a professional that not only does right, but feels right. And it's aligned with your values, your goals, and your personality because the devil's always in the details. And as a quick aside, if you need help in selecting the best buyer's agent and rejecting the rest, 
feel free to email us at hello at knowhowproperty.com.au with the subject header questions to ask before engaging a buyer's agent to get a copy of the 37 questions that we ask potential buyer's agents to decide if they're actually worthy of any further consideration. Because it's all about getting a proven professional buyer's agent who's an expert and specialist in the strategy and the type of property that you're actually looking to secure. And today's returning guest, Kate Hill, and her advisable team are another great example. Now, last week, we delved into Kate's personal, professional and property journey. And this week, we deep dive further into the role and benefits of great professional buyers agents. And we revisit Kate's award-winning property investment book, The Female Investor. So welcome back and let's get invested again, Kate. Amazing. I'm even more overjoyed and honoured to be with you again. Yes, I always love talking uh, property (laughs) with you because it's both of our (laughs) favourite subjects. But uh, I guess to set the scene on all of this, Kate, uh, uh, given the great chat we had last week, uh, what mistakes do you see property buyers and investors making? Oh, it's a bit of a list of those. (laughs) I uh, an obvious one will be buying uh, at the wrong time in the wrong area. So. I, I do love what you said in your intro that it's less about when you buy. And, I, you know, people need to think of that on a personal level. Uh, but there can be a wrong time to buy in an area. And Point. and I think sometimes people get that wrong when they just they just follow the herd. Right. Yeah. I'm Good seeing point. that quite a lot at the moment. Yes. Um, and. Uh, and they just they miss out on capital growth. Right. They wait for let's call it social validation. They're reading about it in the magazines. They want confirmation from the herd. If you then follow that herd, you have generally missed the boat. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the 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 property doesn't grow in value as much as you thought it would. You've got to wait a really long time and you think property doesn't work. <laughs> um, so there's that. Uh like we discussed at length in our amazing chat in part one, uh, not not just not planning, not good planning. Yeah. So you're not, you haven't really got to the nitty gritty of why you're doing this, how you're going to do it. You need to buy to suit your own circumstances. And if you haven't planned, then that is a mistake you are very likely to make. You could get into the wrong loan structure that can uh, also absolutely stop someone in their tracks in terms of making investment mistakes. You need a good broker who can forward plan that with you. Yeah. You could get stung by a spruker, uh, yeah. you know, uh, pretending to be a uh, qualified advisor and, you know, um, uh, seemingly having your best interests at heart. I assure you they don't. Um, that generally means you overpay for property. And then again, you think property doesn't work. Uh, you can, again, part of the not planning thing, the cash flow of the property can be too negative, which means you can't hold it for long enough. You have to sell um, and you think property doesn't work. Uh, But then also, uh, as I admitted in great detail, as I made this mistake myself, when you focus too much on the opposite of having, you know, the cash flow is too good, you're focusing too much on cash flow and less on capital growth, and then it won't grow. And again, you're waiting forever um, and, uh, and you think property doesn't work. Thankfully, I did not think that. I just <laughs> proceeded on anyway. Um, and then obviously there, there can be outside influences too, but I think those, those are some of the big ones in terms yeah, of mistakes no, that people can make. Beautifully mm. summed up. I, I, sort of extending on from there, uh, uh, and again, you get to see this all the time. What, what's an investment approach mm. that you think that the majority get wrong? So uh, I'm going to squeeze two in there, not just one. So buying in their own backyard because they think they know it and it's yeah. easy. Um, you you may know it on a personal level, you know, where the coffee shop is and how to get to work from there, but it doesn't make it a great investment area. Don't assume that. It, it might not be, you know, and you need to be adult enough and honest with yourself <laughs> that that might not be the case. But people do that because there's a lot of fear around it. There's a lot of money involved. You know, they think they can keep an eye on it. Oh my goodness. You know, I think that's, um, there's, that's, 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 that's a big mistake people can make. And, and then also just buying in an area because they've read about it in a magazine, like I've just said. 
So, yeah. you know, they, they take investment advice from the, uh, the mass media. It's too late when that happens. Yeah, very, very mm. uh, hit on those very – I want to sort of uh, flip over now to the other side of the fence and say, okay, well, given that, can you share some of your best tips for us to improve property buying and investment outcomes, as you say? Best tips would really, I think, as uh, and I've sort of you – know, once I've learned from my own mistakes – I, I think an overall strategy is going to be to buy in the best growth location that you can afford with a cash flow that you can afford. And that's very that's a very personal thing, right? Yeah. There's lots of really, really good growth areas out there. Yeah. But um so that that's that that one in a nutshell. Yeah. Buy Buy the property type that is popular and in demand in that local area. Again, don't assume that local people are all like you, that they're going to want the kind of property that you would want to live in. We, you, you need to, um, to get out of that mindset. You know, if you've, if you've, got, if you've got a big four-bedroom house and lots of kids running around and dogs and, you know, you're happy, don't assume that everyone's going to be like, want that kind of property type. Some will, of course, but you need to look at what the masses want. That's who you're buying for. Um, and and I guess to, to get help, get get help and advice if you're, especially if you're buying into state. Again, find out from them what that what what it is that those local people want, and then give them that. Um, the more you appeal to the demand, it's obvious, right? You'll get good growth. You'll get good tenants. Um, and you'll be able to hold it for the long term, you know, um, and and really make sure that those people who are helping you are working in your best interests and not their own. Yeah, that's paramount. Some, yeah, yeah, really yeah, good yeah. points that we could we could uh, mm. spend an hour alone talking about. But I I, I want to specifically now talk about an area that's very close to your heart, and that that's. Uh, buyers agents so why do you think that property buyers should engage a buyers agents over finding and buying a property themselves okay well a number of uh, reasons <laughs> the obvious one really is uh, we are not going to overpay us at advisable certainly are not going to overpay for a property for you i will not get emotionally invested on your behalf and uh, about any property that we are looking at right and um, we won't get emotionally invested and involved in that purchase process now obviously we want you to get one but it's 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 not a property that we must have there'll, there'll be another one right well we'll get another one um if you get a good buyer's agent they will help you decide on the best location to invest in they can help you avoid making really major mistakes like overpaying buying in the wrong suburb, the wrong street, the wrong property type, you know, they can help you find that investment that will suit you and your circumstances and your goals. Again, which will mean that you'll be able to hold that property for longer, for the long term yeah. and get that capital growth that you need and, and build the portfolio because that will get you into the second, the third, the fourth, et cetera, because one property is not going to give you financial freedom. You need to build that portfolio. So you need to get it as right as you can. And getting professional help, in my opinion, is not just from buyers agents, of course, from other professionals too, is really, really, really important. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely mm. great. Well, uh, I'd love for you to, and I want to ask this question in two parts because, uh, you know, I sort of touched on this in the introduction. Yeah. From your perspective, what differentiates a great buyer's agent from the rest? And then as a flow-on from that, uh, what distinguishes advisable in the, in the uh, buyer's agency space? Yeah. So I think that you need to have someone on your side who genuinely has your best interests at heart I, it, it's I, I cannot stress that enough you know there's a, there's a lot of seeming to have your best interests uh out there but you need to find someone who isn't just operating on volume and turnover it's that is really, really, really important, especially obviously it depends on the markets you're buying into. But yeah, um, you need to have someone who is 
empathetic with their clients. And again, it's really important for us to remember that, you know, most, 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 most people buy property once every few years. We yeah. do it every day. Um, I like to always put myself in the shoes of that person who isn't doing this every day. You know, you can't make assumptions around somebody's, like I say, somebody's risk profile or what they're going to be okay with. So you're you're really guiding if you if you if you're going to get people to where they want to go, then you need to understand their likes, and dislikes, and fears, and, and and all those things. It makes a difference to their success and obviously to yours too. Um, I think that's sometimes overlooked. Uh, you know, um, someone who and and that ties in with I guess my next one, which is someone who will do risk profiling with that client. Uh, yes. Will do sample cash flow calculations. The, the, some people don't know how to do that. No. Um, uh, um, who who care about your loan structure? Who know what interest rate you're going to be paying? Uh, who help you plan with your other professionals to build your portfolio? It's it's and again, all of that ties back into number one, which is they're working in your best interests. Yeah. And if they do that, from my perspective, from a bit, it will it will come back to you because you do the right thing by them. They will come back. They will refer all their friends. And, you know, that's that's the best thing for me. So um, and I think, again, someone who can take the time to genuinely wait for that right property to come along. I know it's never going to be perfect. Yeah. But again, not someone who's going to compromise on the quality of the asset because that's better for their business, right? You, uh, we frequently miss out on properties. You know, we we reject, I'd say, 95, probably more percent yep. of listings out there for a number of the myriad reasons. Yeah. So but then you need to be prepared to miss out because we won't overpay. It has to be the right property. But unfortunately, a lot of buyers don't know that you know they don't always know that that agency might just be you know they just need to get the deal done because they're working on turnover exactly so um you cannot compromise on that asset class because uh, on that asset because in a couple of years that will bite you in the bottom totally. um someone who is experienced who has experience uh, knows what works, what doesn't work in a property in that location. And I do, again, I know we all have to start somewhere, but we're talking about hundreds of thousands of your very precious dollars here, your financial future. Put it in the hands of someone who's experienced and who has done this for a long time and knows the ins and outs of it all. Um, uh, you said it beautifully in your introduction, ask them the 37 questions, ask more questions. I highly encourage question asking. <laughs> um, really get to the nitty gritty, uh, 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 to the process of how that agency works. Don't, don't be afraid to ask lots and lots of questions because, again, you, you need to trust the person that you're working with. It's it's not going to work, you know. You, you if you're always feeling nervous, you it's it's. It, I think that can lead to mistakes. Yeah. Um, so don't be afraid to ask thousands of questions. Um, get some client referrals. You know, if they've got nothing to hide, they'll be. You know, they can reach out to a few people and ask them. Do you mind if I have a client who'd like to, or a prospective client who'd like to have a chat with you? Yep, absolutely, no problem. Um, do that. Uh, read Google reviews. I think that's you know, but you you get you get some honest, totally. <laughs> you get some honest stuff on Google. So yeah. people love uh, love reading a Google review. I do it too. Me too. Um, so really, a bit of an overview, but just some of the basics. No, that's good. Right? Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot. That, there's a lot to it, of course. Mm. Putting advisable in that context, what what do you think uh, differentiates yourself and advisable from a lot of the other players in the space? Then, um. So we, I would like to think that we do all of those things uh, that we, so for a start, we have um, an, a national reach, you know, we don't, I'm, I'm not just sort of sitting here in Sydney's eastern suburbs and that's the only place that I buy for property. So that's, that's not how we operate. Um, I think that's much more in the client's best interests. And I, I have set this business up and all of, all of the team here do all of those things that I think I've just talked about that make us really, really good at what we are because we don't ever compromise on the care factor. Yeah. It's, you know, if, 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 if I don't personally 
get a great feeling about that property and if i don't want to buy it i'm never going to show it to a client because if, what, why would you do that you know it, that's not in their best interests um I tr try and take the time to get to know people um we always do that risk profiling property investment plans cash flow calcs so that people are making informed decisions yeah and thereby we're not shoehorning people like i think i said in part one i'm not shoehorning people into just one area because that's easy for us yeah. it's it's very much a tailored approach which yes is more work for us and it's harder work and it's you know <laughs> uh it's a lot of work but again that's it, it it comes back to you because the client is successful they buy a great growth property it grows in value they can hold it for the long term with the cash flow they can afford they are going to come back for more properties and case in point i literally just spoke to someone a little bit earlier today who's coming back for property number four because they're pulling out all this equity in properties one two and three beautiful i that makes me the happiest girl in the world yeah it's <laughs> sensational mm. yeah we sort of touched on this a little bit but I, I sort of want to focus on this now because uh depending on who you talk to in the buyer's agency space there's almost a spectrum between national footprint down to yeah intimate local uh and and uh, you know i sort of hear about the discussion i'd love your thoughts on the the pros and cons of local area buyers mm. versus the the national reach that advisable achieves yes so uh absolutely pros and cons to each one and uh the caveat there is depending on the agency so uh i think a and i, I trying to think about this genuinely objectively you know not just because well um we we have a national reach but a buyer's agent who's local so i guess you can have a buyer's agent who's local to the area that you are intending to buy in as well as perhaps somebody who's local to where you live I mean, but yeah. if if we think about somebody who's local to the area or living in the area that you intend to buy a property in so i guess you could argue that that person will hopefully have let's make the assumption that they have great local knowledge insights they'll know every street inside out they have a great social and uh, not social sorry a, a great strong network yep. of other professionals right yep. Yep. um uh honestly i'm not sure what the other pros would be i mean those are pretty good pros don't get me wrong yeah, they'll know yeah, what yeah, they'll yeah. they'll know the local demographic they'll know what property type to buy um but um, as a as an agency with a national reach, we obviously have a more a more broad scope of offering. The local buyer's agent will only ever talk to you and offer to you and recommend to you the suburbs that are within that local area. Yeah, and that might not suit you. Yeah, uh, it you know you might not have enough money or the yield might not be strong enough. Um, it might not, in fairness, be a great growth area from an investment perspective. You cannot make that assumption, right? Exactly. But I, I, I guess I liken this a little bit too. If you walk into, if you walk into CBA Commonwealth Bank branch, and that lovely person behind the desk is going to offer you CBA products, they're not going to go, "Hey, if you just pop down the road to the ANZ, they've got a much better offering." Yeah. better loan structure to suit you because you're self-employed you this year that the other pop down the road and you know and have a nice life it's never going to happen they are going to sell you cba products right yeah. so and that's the difference between going to a bank and a mortgage broker who's got a panel of 40 lenders who will look at your situation etc cetera, etc cetera. so and i don't mean to disrespect anyone else who has that local approach right so um some out there will say that uh, I, to me that service offering is limited and it will also assume that you know in advance where you want to buy yes which some people do some people do nothing wrong with that right as long as you know that is generally where, where you want to do there'll be people people who argue that uh, somebody with a national reach doesn't have the same local insights that they well they lack local insight or the depth of local knowledge and i'm sorry but i'm going to say nonsense it's just not the case <laughs> um i've got in a plane last week I, I you know i'm looking at areas all the time 
uh, we travel, uh, we have really strong connections with local people who help. Um, and in my mind, what I do is actually a way more personalized and ethical service because I'm not sure warning them into the area where I'm sitting. Yes. I, even though it's harder for me, it's hard, it's more work. I think what I do is in the, in the client's better interest. Um, and we have more diverse experience and expertise, which others don't. And it's, you know, in this day and age, absolutely. So well, that, yeah. that is, and I know it sounds like it's vested interest, but I'm genuinely, that is, that that's what I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, my own belief, <laughs> uh, outside of I have no, no, uh, invested interest in the buyer's agency space, but my, my just from a an investment perspective and and that uh, de-risking and maximising opportunity concern, mm. we've got fifteen thousand different suburbs and towns around the country and, a net, and yeah. nearly eleven million properties. The chance that the best performing property to achieve your goals is going to be in your backyard, whether it be the buyers or the buyers agents, are pretty slim. Uh, right. And if you've got someone who's got a, an understanding of what's happening right across the country, and importantly, because I, you know, in the argument I hear from a lot of the the local buyers agencies that oh these these national guys they just it's all desktop, uh, they did everything on the computer, they don't really understand mm. the intimacy of, of the local area. Uh, whereas you know you, you've just shared with us that you're jumping on a plane and you're walking the streets and you're and you're talking, touching and smelling and and feeling properties. <laughs> Very area. much so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, that that discounts that uh, pretty strongly and opens up the uh, buyer to a much bigger opportunity. That's right. Uh, that that's more likely then to achieve what whatever mm. their, their goals are at the end of the day. So that's no, right. And that. and look, and just as as an add on, sorry, but it's you know when I when I'm talking to a client and we're talking about an air, an interstate or an area that is away from where the client is, and it could also be away from where I physically am. I need to know those areas, obviously, because when I'm talking to a client about suburbs and their risk profiles, and I need to know where within that location is going to obviously be a great investment. We yes. never lose sight of that. But at the no. end of the day, it's the client who is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a property. They need to feel good about it. And if they're in an area that they're not comfortable with, there's a high tenant turnover, the cash flow is poor because of that. That's never going to work. So... And I have to give the clients the confidence that I know these areas, which I do, you know, yeah. so it's, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. No, beautifully said. Mm. Uh, one of the areas that, that uh, there's a, from where I see it, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors around, Kate, uh, is in the, the area of, of exclusive, silent or off-market properties. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and, you know, a lot of buyers agents you know, sort of, sell the sizzle that you know that that's that's where the gold is because they're going to find mm. properties that no one else is going to find i'd love to get your take on uh, the merits or otherwise of these type of off-market properties and where that sits in relation to how how you play yeah it's 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 interesting when you sort of sit here and and and, and think about you know when you when you ask me questions like that and i think about well I'd love the, it's, it's, it is absolutely spruced as this, you know, this golden goose, this great, this, this, this great offering that this, that these people have. But the question always comes down to why is it off market? It's the yeah. first why, what's wrong with it? It's the first question I ask. Um, depends on the market conditions, of course, right? Yeah. But it, you, you, you have to ask as many questions as to that off, why that market is off, why that property is off market ask those 37 find 37 questions to ask you know because i'm asking them yeah um yeah. we we get offered all off market properties all the time and and often especially in very active markets when it seems to be the most appealing way to go because you know you're 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 jumping to the front of the queue what is wrong with it why are they not taking it to the open market there might be nothing wrong with it but it's it's always you know the, the the process for assessing any asset has to be the same regardless of whether it's off market or not yeah. now like i said we get off market offerings all the time and it comes down to the actual property the market conditions it's being sold in if that market is really really hot and active like i said my first question is what was wrong with it why is it being sold off market why are they not taking it to the open market where some somebody 
is going to pay 50 grand more for it than I will. Yeah. Um, what's wrong with it? Um, and, and the answer often is that there is something wrong with it. It's an inferior location. Uh, there are structural issues or other, you know, problems with the actual physical assets, who, who knows. Um, but there can be legitimate reasons why the property is off market. It might just be that the owners don't want their personal business splashed all over the internet because local people watch their own property markets. They know, you know, when for sale signs go up, um, yep. could be a divorce or a separation. Yep. There could be a bit of an awkward tenant. There are, there are a lot of, of, um, of genuine, like I say, legitimate reasons why property is off market, but it is not an instant golden goose. Be very cautious. And it's it's all about the seller and the agent's motivations. It doesn't make it a great investment property, and it doesn't mean that the buyer's agent has all this miraculous access to properties that you know that no one else does. It's just not the case. Yeah, beautifully said. And 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 mm. starting with that question, well, what's wrong with it? Uh, is a pretty good place to <laughs> start know. because that, that's going to make people it? dance. That is going to make yeah. people dance. What's and, wrong and, with it? And and as you say, there could be a very genuine reason. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. But if it's yeah. it's a lazy agent who's uh, or someone who's trying to mm. uh, sell a property untested in the market, so you that's know, right. The, the price tag that's attached to that, then you know, how do you validate what the true value of that property is and what the buyer should mm. pay for it? Becomes a lot more mythical in my mind. So uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, and and I'm seeing it a lot at the moment. Well, which um, again, I guess I'd put it under the heading legitimate reason, is that because rents have jumped so much in Australia, you know, in the last eighteen months or so, two years, yeah, uh, there are a lot of tenants out there who are paying way under market value rent for a property. Yeah, and it is it's hard that makes it much harder of course for an investor to then purchase that property in this interest environment uh where they need a certain yield often from the bank and yeah. um and, and you know if you've got a property that's that's currently with a you know long-term tenant in there for the next six months paying 100 150 bucks a week under where it should be then they'll the, the agent might put that out to the you know, to their database, to me, go, hey, you know, have you got a client who this could work for? Great tenants, nothing sinister. It's just that it needs to be getting more than, way more than it is, and it's going to be hard to sell, yeah. right? So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's one of those, so that that kind of thing, you know, so. Yeah, mm. and, and, and it's those things that the people go, oh, okay, well, that, that makes sense. That's so, why, but, yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that. I, I, I mm. want to switch gears now, uh, Kate, and yeah. circle back to uh, a chat you and I had a couple of years ago when we when we uh, dove into your uh, award winning book, The Female Investor, uh, and for those that that haven't listened to that or uh, haven't had a chance to read the book, uh, I'd love you to give us a bit of an update on why you wrote it. What mm. are the key messages in the book, and, uh, and probably something we didn't touch on last time? What impact has uh, has the book had, as you said? Mm. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so yes, and it. Thank you for calling it award-winning. It did win the National Personal Finance and Investment Book Award. Yes, uh, we were very proud of that. <laughs> um, so look, there's I, the key messages were that we really wanted to help address gender disparities when it comes to financial wealth for wealth creation to empower women in the realm of property investing recognize the gender-based salary deficits and financial challenges that women often face. Yep. We wanted to promote financial independence, um, dare I say financial literacy. I don't mean that in obviously in yep. a condescending way, but there's no. a lot that I would say that to anyone to be fair, but yeah, um, but really to provide anyone, but women specifically with the knowledge um, and some tools necessary to build wealth, equity, get to financial independence through property, uh, and and also just simply filling a gap in the literature. Right? Yeah. Um, there's very little out there by women. It's it's getting better, I must say. But at the time, this is 
a little while ago now, but um, yeah. at the time it was it's 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 very male heavy. Love all you fellas, don't get me wrong, uh, but a very male heavy industry. Totally, one hundred percent agree. Um, so you know, we want to identify, like I say, a gap in that literature regarding property investment, which specifically aimed at women. Yes, but like you said, look at the content. Obviously, you know the principles of when and how and what to buy. It, you know, applies to applies to everyone. But really, it was meant to be motivational, a bit of a rally cry, call to action. I've had some great feedback. Uh, right. Honestly, you know, I pe- women who have who emailed to go, oh, I've just read your book. It's amazing. I'm, you know, I'm making plans or I'm talking to a financial planner or um, or who, you know, have gone ahead and forged, you know, started building property portfolios. It's 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 it's. it's when that just happens once, Nicola and I kind of feel, well, well, job done, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you just sort of help help one person, you feel like, oh, that was, you know, it was worth doing. Totally. So, um, totally. That, that, yeah. That's awesome, eh? And what mm. I love about books is that they are, they're there forever. They're just ticking, ticking away in the background. Mm. Yes, uh, and it's and and uh, you, I'm sure you're experiencing this, but I, I know you, uh, even now, I, I, I think. I published my book back in 2018 from memory, so it's quite a yeah. bit back now. Uh, I still get uh, out of the blue emails saying, yes. hey, I just read your book. It's, it's been great. It's just a, yes. sowing the seed that, that it can potentially grow into oak I trees uh, just through the written word is yeah. absolutely sensational. Absolutely. And it, it, and it ties back into what I said um, in, in part one of our discussion. You know, I think I, I would hope people will go back and listen to that, that I, I have a genuine interest in helping you know in sharing uh you know sharing the knowledge um spreading the word out there that this isn't you know i know it's it can be a bit scary it's it can be a bit overwhelming there's a lot of information out there but you have to get started and i and that is just rewarding in itself you know the fact that you have reached someone that you've touched someone or gotten someone to take make a, you know take a step it's 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 all I could ask for, you know, for just from a purely altruistic perspective. No, I absolutely agree. And, mm, and you've, you've mentioned this a couple of times uh, during the discussion last week and today, but but everything that uh, you know, I hear in, in CB yourself, Kate, is all about the care factor that you talk about, and that, and that's a very rare commodity in, in any yeah. space, actually. Uh, but the, the level of genuine care... Uh, that that comes through and everything you say uh, is really further evidence in the book. And you know, I've read the book from cover to cover, uh, and there's a, there's a lot of gold in it for for anyone at any level. Actually, yeah, whether they uh, haven't started or they're an experienced investor, there's some real real mm. gold on it. And mm. one of the areas that I'd like to sort of dive into a little bit and get you to expand on, if I can, and I'm going to test your memory here because it's a while since. Eek. But, uh, I've got it. I'm holding it up, everyone. I'm clutching yes, it. Go on. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. <laughs> the, yeah. One thing I think is relevant to what we've been talking about today, which is the, you know the whole buying the property piece, is mm. love for you to give us a quick summary on your discussion around when, where, what, and how to buy. Given oh, the goodness. the intro that I gave, because I yeah, uh, it's, it's something of real interest around that. Can can you remember that and and share some uh, some yeah. of the key bits of that? I think so. Uh, I'm not sure about a quick summary, but yes, don't you know. <laughs> You know me well enough now. Um, so the when, uh, when, just whenever you really, so I think as I've already alluded to, there's two separate whens to me. There's when for you and when in the property market, yes. if I can call it that. So yes. when for you, whenever you can, just do it when you can. Don't wait. There's always somewhere good to buy. It's very rare Property markets across Australia all do the same thing at the same time. There's always somewhere good to buy. So in terms of when for you, like like I said, do it when, now, do it. If you can, do it. Don't wait. Yeah. Um, when in terms of areas, it's really, we're looking in the book at optimal timings yeah. for property investing, considering factors like market trends, economic conditions, um, and I'm hoping that we have provided insights into identifying those kind of opportune moments in terms of property cycles where you can maximise your returns, yeah. not do what I did at Gladstone, as we discovered last year, uh, in our episode last week, <laughs> last week. Um, you know, by right at the top of the market in a highly volatile environment. Um, 
where, so that location, we'll look, it's really the age-old question, right, identifying locations. Um, we try to give guidance on selecting the right location for you personally yep. and also obviously you're, you you have to you have to balance making a great investment decision location wise uh, on that perspective but it all also has to work for you yes so um that is that's key so we are exploring growth potential rental yields uh infrastructure development demographic trends all those kind of things and then what to buy, I think I've already alluded to, we're looking at demographics yeah. um, and you're looking at the property type that you're buying for those local people. Yeah. Discusses kind of pros and cons of each property type as well. You know, So even though it can be a particular property type that is common and in demand in that area, you need to think about whether that property type is then right for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then how... Uh, we give lots and lots of practical advice on the process of purchasing, you know, conducting due diligence and how it all works, negotiating, having a whole team. So uh, I'm not sure that was quick, but it's a summary. Yeah, no, that, that, <laughs> yes. that, and that, I just want to whet people's appetite because you go into a lot more detail on the, mm. the but uh, yes. I encourage people to dive in because that, that's that's the guts of the yes yeah, as I as I said in the the intro uh, the, the other thing that flow on and I love your discussion uh, in the book about this but can you give us a, a bit of an outline on your six locational metrics to understand she's frantically looking at that page um yes I think I can so um I I find it really hard to be brief about this bushy I'll just warn yeah. you now because this is what I do it's my passion right so it's really hard so I'm going to try and be really really brief yeah so in terms of the six location metrics would be looking at a location and what's going on there this is all about infrastructure development so what money is being spent on hospital expansions roads in big infrastructure projects what are they and what impact are they going to have on that area yeah. who lives there yeah again this is all ties into what we've kind of been talking about right so you're analyzing the demographic trends you're looking at population growth but not just growth you're looking at how many people are living there and then who are they in terms of age categories all that kind of thing who are you finding out who you're buying for and then where do they want to live? It will help you assess the current future demand for property, right? How well off these people are or that area is, you're looking at economic vibrancy. It's crucial. Yeah. Yes. You, you can, you know, you can have, um, but let me, let me do the next one, then I'll come back to those two. So, and then what do they do for a living? So what industries are there? Yeah. So you're looking at economic vibrancy and how many industries are there. So it's not a one horse town yeah. and or that all subsequent industries service that one major one, like a tourism town or agriculture or mining, keep coming back to that. <laughs> so you can have, for example, an economically vibrant area that is a one horse town in industry. Mm. And you can have a very diverse area in terms of industries where people work that is economically stagnant so yeah. you kind of need to tick all those boxes right yeah um and then and then really finally you're looking at supply and demand so what is and that all it kind of ties everything brings everything together you have to understand those current and future supply levels of property so how many are they building is it enough is it too much? Is it too little? Where is it going? All those kind of things. This, those are the six. Yeah, no, I've done well, and, and you've done very well to summarise <laughs> those, those quickly because there's, there's a yeah. lot of there lot is of a lot there. in between, mm. the, between the bones there that you, you nearly get your head around. But so, the, at least we're we're starting to reinforce the key things that need to people need to yes. take into account. And I think mm. given the the petrol that COVID uh, uh, that the pandemic poured on on property. Uh, they're even more important now than what they were then because mm. a lot of areas have gone through very sharp growth. Yes. Less those growth drivers so attached to them ongoing, there's a lot of areas that are going to plateau Correct. sideways for an extended period of time. Yes. So that's really key. Now, one of the other things I, I love in the 
in the book that you talk about uh, is the uh, uh, and I'll ask you the question because I know it's covered. Uh, why can downturns be good and bubbles be bad? Mm. So downturns uh, and downturns. Yeah, that can actually be, I think that can be in sentiment as well. Um, yeah. So yeah. downturns can be viewed, I guess, as opportunities for investors because they present a chance to purchase assets at lower prices. Yep. Um, you can you can you can look at it at, at, at fundamentally coming back to Warren Buffett again. Really, you know, buying when others are fearful. Um, if if the if the underlying the fundamentals are still there, you know, you can find assets that really do become undervalued, which allows an investor to get in at a good level, not at the top and not when it's half done, but really, you know, right almost at the bottom. It's hard to time, of course, with property, but. Um, uh, can be when all those basic fundamentals are there. On the other hand, obviously bubbles. I've been there. I've done it, as I'm mentioning times. Um, they are they're bad. It leads to inflated asset prices. It can result, not always, but it can result in significant market corrections if the bubble bursts. Right? Bubbles can often create. Depends on the bubble. It can, often create artificial demand. You need to drill down why that bubble's there. We have things in our press all the time about property bubbles, yeah. um, which is nonsense. And, and then I also think on the opposite side, we don't have enough about property bubbles when there genuinely is one because yes. it's, not in the, it's not in the media's interest to no. report the correct facts of which way around it's going. Spot on. <laughs> and I think what sort of underpins that to some degree uh, and we've touched on this before is you know, if you're a contrarian investor and you've got a long enough horizon mm -hmm. better swimming in ponds where there's less less fish but it's got the right right uh, uh it's the right pond species of fish. yeah yes. exactly <laughs> uh, i'm bonding yeah. around with the analogy but uh, right. but but you're absolutely right rather than follow mm -hmm. the herd uh get caught in the rush pay mm. too much and then wonder why this property doesn't continue. That's to right. It's in value uh, while right. it goes sideways for an extended period. So yes. I love that. Uh, mm. I, I guess to put a, a, a big bow around the whole uh, property buying piece, mm. if, you like, uh, if you could ma wave a magic wand and change anything, what would you change about buying property and investing? Mm. Um, okay. I would, I would I, I, waving my magic wand, I would make – all the powers that be at all levels of government understand some really basic supply and demand fundamentals that make them all magically see why they've created their own rental crisis across the country. Yes. That's what I would do. Yes. That's what I would do. Um, sorry, I know that doesn't sort of relate specifically to, you know, people well, property I, buying, but it kind of does. It does. It does. Yeah. That's what I would do. I would just make them all see sense. Yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> there's a uh, there's a whole podcast on itself oh, talking about podcast. the naivety of the politicians and some of the half-assed, short-sighted, uh, cut off your nose to spite your face stuff that's being thrown around. At yes, the moment. and uh, and but it but it has a flow-on effect to that sentiment out there, you know. Uh, so and it puts people off following their path and their plan towards property investing. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Mm. Totally I've, I've often often said, Kate, if you swim in a septic pond, then you're going to get a mouthful of poo, uh, and that that's exactly what happens in the mainstream media, sadly, because yeah. uh, if, if mm. you're hearing it and and consuming it all the time, it's going to rub off. It's going to affect yes. yeah. your, your outlook. Uh, so, you know, as you said in in part mm. one, uh, trying to ignore the mainstream media and and make sure you're very careful about where you get your information uh, is a, is a key part of all of this. But yes. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, I always finish these conversations to, by asking you to get out the crystal ball, uh, because you know, as we as you, we both know, everyone in property wants to know what's going to happen next. Yeah. Uh, so I'd love your read on on current property conditions in the in the sort of medium term, and as a flow on from that, without nailing you to a perch, where and what are the best investment opportunities, particularly for growth investors uh, that you're seeing at the moment? Yeah. Okay. So. 
um, as as I've explained, you know, our, our area of expertise, our speciality really is Australia. You know, we're licensed in multiple states. We're buying all over the place. We, we customize every search. So I, I feel, you know, I've got my fingers in a lot of pies. I'm traveling a lot. I'm talking to a lot of people. So we've seen, we're still seeing a bit of a frenzy in Perth, in Adelaide. They are the most affordable options or st that still just uh, for investors. They give great yields um, in this higher interest environment. But coming back to bubbles, we'd have to consider, you know, whether Perth really is the right thing to do now. Is it too late? Has the ship sailed? Yep. Um, I kind of think it has. Um, yep. But there are a lot of other property markets that I would say are in a very steady holding pattern that are poised yeah it's like we're just waiting you know that they, they aren't stagnant but they are kind of they're moving ahead and they're kind of ticking along and there's a little bit of growth happening but we are still seeing a lot of strong local demand from within australia within these regions like southeast queensland victoria south yep. wales adelaide you know all these great markets Hundreds of thousands of new migrants. I know we've had an influx of intake. They were playing catch up. That will settle down. Yeah. There's still billions and billions of infrastructure projects going ahead. Yeah. And there is still an undersupply of really quality listings out there, which, you know, is like it's kind of holding everything up. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to collapse when new listings come on because we have this, uh, we have such strong demand. Um. Um, you know, not not just from migrants. Don't blame them. Um, <laughs> blame politicians. Um, uh, but from from within, you know, there's 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 really good strong demand in. And when I say great growth areas, I mean it's 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 God. I could just I could list you know fifteen different areas. Really, like I say, there's a lot in Southeast Queensland, Sunshine Coast. You're looking at. You know, your Geelongs, your Ballarats, your Bendigos, your Adelaides, North and South. Yeah. Sydney, you know, for those who can afford it and can stand the yield. Um, really, some really great locations within those locations. I do not see that going, the demand for those pro for properties in those locations going anywhere anytime soon. They're not building enough. Yeah. Every single state, there was a big thing in the paper just two days ago about Victoria, they are 50% behind where they need to be in terms of building. And are we surprised when we look at federal and state government policies there? Don't get me started on that again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's But the demand, it's not, it's not going anywhere. So, and they're not building enough. They're not building enough. And that is, it's, it's and if interest rates go up, uh, go down even if they go up again they will come down again there's you know it depends on which paper you read and where you get your information from but if there is even the the mumblings uh of interest rates that might go down it just fire lights a fire under everything 100 percent. don't I'm, wait yeah I, picking be, between the eyes there of, of what you've shared I, I think the real opportunity for, and again as a as a natural contrarian uh, i don't i don't like uh running with a pack. Uh, I prefer to look at areas that, that haven't taken off yet, but mm. as you say, they're about to. And there's a lot of those areas, uh, particularly amongst the locations you've talked about, they're going to provide the opportunity where you can get on board with a good buyer's agent and negotiate mm. a, a good deal without yeah. falling over others to try and do the same thing. Yes. Uh, and I think that the smart buyers, uh, rather than listen to what the, the current hotspot is, uh, are looking at, okay, well, what's really going to position myself and give me the time to actually do the work and negotiate yeah. the, the right value, not, not a cheap cheap uh, purchase, but the right value for that property and then ride the wave once the rest of the herd comes in. So beautifully said. Uh, in, in wrapping it up, before we jump into the, the second ambush round, uh, Kate, uh, uh, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to say uh, that you haven't had a chance to share? No, not not really. To be honest, no. I think we've covered a lot of it. I I, I would do. sorry, we have covered it. I'm going to reiterate it. Do not use the mainstream media for investment advice. Don't do it. Don't do it. Be aware, but run them up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's beautifully said. Now mm. we're, we're going to get out the the blindfold and cigarette again for round two, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd love for you to share what's your favourite quote and why. Oh, you know what? I have it almost at the bottom of a lot of my emails. Um, it is, no human is limited. 
It's by Elliot Kipchoge, who is just a beautiful human being and world champion marathon runner. Yeah, I love it. No. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. And the sentiment is there, you know, don't, it, yeah, no human is limited. Yeah, there's uh, it's self-explanatory there. Uh, apart from your book, The Female Investor, oh. what's the top book that you'd recommend we read and why? Now, I, I thought about this and I really had to look at uh, what's on my shelf, what's got the most post-it notes in it, <laughs> <laughs> what's the most thumbed through. And this, I guess this might surprise people. It is work, kind of work-related, right, finance-related. Um, uh, it would be uh, One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. Nice. It has amazing insights really into fundamental analysis it's a, it's funny you know it's not dry, it's not one of those dry tomes that you're losing the will to live it's funny it's a great read there's a lot of crossover with property and how you research some of those fundamentals so yeah i pick that that's mm. a very good one that's a very good one uh, i'm gonna sort of change uh, direction a little bit now uh, if, if you won 50 million dollars tomorrow yeah what would you spend it on and why? Mm. Oh, my God. I would uh, obviously pay off all, all my remaining debt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd probably sneak in a few more properties. Don't tell John. Uh, <laughs> um, I would, I'd, I'd like to think, uh, you know, I, 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 we are very frugal people. I don't think I need a lot to be very happy in life. So I would like to think that I would then be, Paying off a lot of other people's debt too. I would, tr I would really love to set up some kind of charitable foundation yeah. that is an ongoing, has an ongoing effect on people's lives in kind of my, you know, sort of chosen area of, of charities that I like to work with, um, yeah. and um, I that 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 has longevity, you know, but that it sort of that where the the foundation itself invests and and it, you know has an ongoing. Yeah, awards yeah. and yeah yeah Love but really it. so that money really is you know used for the greater good too yeah yeah, yeah beautifully said that uh, last one uh and again it follows my own belief that we, we we become our habits uh so what whatever we're doing on a regular basis uh, ends up exponentially uh, taking us in one direction or the other mm. uh, so what's a, a current personal happy habit or rewarding ritual or daily discipline that you employ that you think's contributed most to your success today, Kate? Oh, I'm going to be boring. It's going to be running, long distance running. Yeah. Um, I, it's, I, it's, 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 it helps me in so many ways that uh, again, whole other podcast, right. But uh, apart from just the health, physical health aspects, it's good for mental health. I find it really meditative. Yeah. So, um, not when I'm not arguing with myself about what, what on earth are you doing and stop immediately. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but I do, you, you get into, you know, you just get into a groove. You, um, it, it gives you time to think about things, you know, it, um, it kind of, it hits a reset button. Um, probably because at the end of it, you're just too tired to even care about the small stuff anymore. Right. You're like, oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, um, it would be, it would be that. Love it, love it. Uh, it's it's active meditation, really. Plus, it it, it burns out any aggression. I, I, I'm talking as a bloke now, but uh, when when I'm exercising, you know, I don't do mm. ones, but I but I, I love to keep active. Yeah, it just get, gets rid of all of the frustrations and whatnot that build up, and I'm a much nicer person as a result of it. Mm. But uh, just ask Sonia, she'll tell you. Um, and I guess bring this whole thing uh, to a, a conclusion then, mm. so in thinking about what we spoke about last week and this week, what final thoughts and takeaways do you want to leave us with don't be scared don't be fearful forge your own path there is so much news out there that is going to affect everything that you do shut it out you know they're there they are attention grabbing you will go down a black hole of doom scrolling don't do it um get started and keep going it's, uh, you know, uh, like I said a couple of times, one property isn't enough, right? You need to build a portfolio of assets because before you know it, you will be 50 and you will think it's too late. It's not, but you'll think it's too late and then you're going to make mistakes. 
Yeah, no, beautifully said. Uh, to sort of wrap it up then, if I ask you to get invested, what, what does that mm. mean to you? Just get started. Just start, start investing, um, however small that is, or at least start the mindset of it, putting, you know, from a, dare I say, you know, the, the rich dad, poor dad thing, but put, put your, put some of your assets, put some of your earnings aside. You need to allocate resources to this and just and get started. You've got to do it because getting yourself in a position where you've got passive income coming in is real freedom and independence. Yeah, beautifully said. Uh, Kate, for those that have really resonated with with your uh, messages on the last two uh, chats, uh, and we'll have your links in the show notes, obviously, but, but how... Mm listeners find out more and get more involved with you so uh our website is www.advisable.com.au advisable has an e in the middle um and uh, my email address is kate at advisable.com.au more than happy to have a chat with people we'll have a youtube channel and i give weekly updates property tips area location stuff so give it a watch of that and like i said you know what you see is what you get it's <laughs> just trying to share information out there. So that's, I guess, those are the, the, the main ways. Perfect. And now I, I, we, we spoke offline about uh, potentially issuing a, a challenge for mm. those that are really tuned in to grab a, a copy of, of your book, The Female Investor. Uh, do you want to talk us through that? I do. So um, if you would like to email me at uh, kate at advisable with an E in the middle, dot com dot au, and I think tell me what your what you found the most useful takeaway for you personally of either of our two conversations i would love to know how how this has read if and how it's resonated with anyone beautiful awesome mm. uh, make sure i'm going to encourage people to do that because it really is a great read uh, and and as we sort of come to a close now Kate, i want to thank you again for thank taking you. all of the considerable time to refresh us on your wealth of wisdom around the book and the benefits of working with proven professional buyers agents over the last two episodes uh before we close though i just need to ask everyone a big favor that they're only going to take a couple of seconds of your time uh, because currently about 71 percent of you that watch the property hub podcast don't subscribe so if you've ever enjoyed our shows and videos like the one today uh following the hours that myself and my support team put into preparing and producing the episodes uh, can you please do us a massive favor and just hit the subscribe button now because it helps the property hub channel more than you know and given the algorithms and, and of the platforms i can promise you that the bigger the channel gets the better the best get uh, better the guests are going to be and the better your investment learnings will get so uh, uh and uh, also uh, just before we we close out to keep the conversation going just join and jump onto the property hub collective facebook community by clicking the link in the show notes where Kate, if she's open to it and or other property professionals can answer any of your personal questions or queries and continue to share their knowledge with you and other like-minded hardworking Aussies in a very safe and no pressure environment. So jump on board and in closing, thanks again for getting invested, Kate. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. And don't leave yet until you've taken the next step towards living by design. By getting my award-winning book, Get Invested, absolutely free when you sign up at knowhowproperty.com.au or bushymartin.com.au. And finally, make sure you subscribe to Property Hub to get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration, along with every episode of Realty Talk, Australia's leading property show for red-hot property investing news and insights, direct, from industry leaders and influencers. Remember to always get invested in your knowledge and I look forward to seeing you next time.